would carry on going up to 70 pounds a ton by 2030 and at that price nuclear power would um, be economic and so would a large number of renewables <clears throat> and coal would be displaced by gas. Uh, so the way this would be done is that the Treasury would impose a corrective tax on the forward price of the emissions trading system. Well, that looks fine. The question is, is it credible? And the answer is no, because very shortly afterwards, the government said, nobody else in Europe is doing this, uh, so maybe we should change our mind and lower the price. So any price that is announced by a Treasury can be changed at any budget and is therefore not credible. Uh, so that route for hoping that the market will be guided to make the right decisions is unfortunately not working very well. <coughs> so if we were to look back and ask, is the energy only market good for the job? Um, in principle, it could be if it were allowed to work without price caps, if there was no subsidized entry by competing technologies. And if the carbon price were credible and giving strong forward price signals uh, and we were in equilibrium and people made efficient decisions, then it would work. <coughs> um, but we can look across the Atlantic and see that in the United States where they do have price caps, um, there has been recognized the so-called missing money problem. If the price can't go high enough, then you can't cover the cost of the capital that you need for an adequate reserve margin, and you have to then think, how are you going to persuade people to make investments? <clears throat> if you look at places where they have long-term power purchase agreements, in other words, in countries where people don't trust the government very much, in other words, a large number of countries, uh, then those long-term power purchase agreements typically have a capacity element and an energy element. So it's explicitly built in that the capital cost will be recovered and the system will dispatch the plant on the short-run marginal cost, which is essentially the energy element. <clears throat> um, so that one solution to do it, um, but if you have to face up with low prices uh, created by a massive influx of renewables, uh, then there's a problem if you don't have a capacity payment element. So. <clears throat> Just to sum up, it's the problem that we lack the sufficient set of markets to support efficient decisions, compounded with the uncertainty about future policy uh, that gives rise to a case for a capacity mechanism. Right, so that's the theory. Now, whereabouts have we got to? Uh, so the specific problem in Europe is that we have very ambitious renewable energy supply and electricity supply targets. Um, and those increase intermittency. Uh, the wind or the sun don't always provide the power. Um, and that requires backup capacity, flexible peaking plant uh, that will then operate when the sun or the wind isn't providing the power. Um, and in the old markets, uh, this was quite straightforward. The old plant uh, gradually became more obsolete, was run less and less, but it was worth keeping for the occasional ability to deliver power when it was needed. Um, so the retiring old coal plants in Britain and in many countries had that very useful purpose. But we have now passed a number of directives. The large combustion plant directive comes in in 2016 and that limits the number of hours the coal plant can run uh, unless it takes very invest expensive investment decisions. Uh, the Integrated Emissions Directive uh, is an additional set of constraints that would require a great deal of investment to meet these um, requirements. The carbon price floor in Britain makes it uneconomic to run the coal plant, so the source of our backup is being removed from the system. Now, until recently, um, that wouldn't have been a problem, well, at least in the 90s it wasn't a problem because gas was cheap and gas generation is cheap and so people built a large quantity of gas-fired generation, even in this country. Um, but the price of gas has gone up. The number of hours that it's economic for them to run in competition with coal has gone down. The economics of investing in gas-fired generation looks terrible. They're making negative spark spreads in many countries, so it would be insane to invest. Uh, and if you can't build coal and you can't build gas and you need peaking plant, then there's clearly a problem. So, um, 
And we also have, as I've stressed, the uncertainty about the policy environment. We don't know what's happening post-2020, and even if politicians told us what they think will happen, we don't believe them, um, and there's plenty of evidence that they keep changing their mind. So the problem that face privatized electricity industries is how on earth can you justify investing in the plant that you need to meet the reliability conditions which intermittency makes even more acute? Um, and in particular, how do we now go about procuring this security of supply problem? Well, let's come back to measuring security of supply. And as I've said, it's measured by the loss of load expectation. Um, and the problem is that the implied value of lost load is £17 a kilowatt hour, but the markets are capped. So in particular, the day ahead market of Europe is capped at uh, €3,000 a megawatt hour or €3 Euros a kilowatt hour. In Britain, the balancing costs that the system operator will be allowed to introduce in a year's time uh, are capped at £6 a kilowatt hour. Uh, so you can do the calculation and say, well, there's a missing money problem, and it's £17 minus £6 in GB times three hours a year. So that's something like £33 a kilowatt per year um, is missing. Um, that may not sound very much, but if you think of a 1,000 megawatt plant, that's £33 million a year. So how do we meet the problem of missing money, and the proposal was we have an auction uh, to decide how much is needed. <coughs> um, now, let's take a digression and ask, if we're going to decide on the auction, we have to decide how much we're going to procure. In order to do that, we have to be clear about what the security standard is, and that comes back to understanding what the loss of load, which is a very emotive word, because it suggests the lights are going to go out if we lose load, <coughs> then what does it actually mean? And it means technically that if the market is left to its own devices, the demand will be greater than the supply. But, uh, and this is a slide from our regulator Ofgem, you can see that at the extreme left-hand end, um, the situation where market supply exceeds demand is before the system operator steps in to balance the system. The system operator has a duty to make sure that the system is balanced instantaneously every millisecond. Um, and because we are facing in the end of this year a, su a significant risk of uh, the supply exceeding demand in the market, um, the system operator has been given a large number of new balancing services. He has gone out and procured short-term operating reserves, demand-side balancing reserves, and has various other tricks available. One of which is he can reduce the voltage. Without the lights going out, they go slightly dim, uh, and that reduces the power taken on the system. Uh, he can require generators to exceed their design performance for short periods of time, which is costly for the generators. They are paid, uh, but again, it increases supply beyond what the market would have otherwise done. Uh, and there are a whole range of emergency services that he can call on. Um, and only when all of these options have been exhausted is there control disconnection, which is not the same as the lights going out. It means that a certain plant are switched off. Uh, and the point I want to make is that it's the control disconnections which we think of as the loss of real load. Um, and all of the actions that are taken before then are considerably cheaper than the cost of the value of lost load. So um, bear that in mind when we come on to deciding how much capacity we should procure. It's a question of what's it worth to pay for extra capacity. Now, let me just describe the capacity auction. Um, it's, um, if you like, state of the art. Uh, the government was unusually prescient in asking for advice from other countries. Normally, we think that anything that's invented anywhere else is obviously wrong. But this time, uh, we were, uh, the government was persuaded that the United States had been running capacity auctions for many years and had learnt many lessons from doing that. And so they hired the brightest and the best of the auction designers from America and said, 
okay, tell us how to do it. So this is the answer. It's a descending clock auction. Um, it, uh, if you're building new capacity, obviously you want some assurance that you're going to get paid not just this year but for some future time. So they get a 15-year indexed contract. Uh, but if you've got plant on the system, the only question we're interested in is can you be persuaded or at what cost can you be persuaded to keep it running for another year? And then we'll ask again in a year's time. So they get a one-year auction. Uh, the demand side is basically left out of this until 2016. Um, and this is a T minus four auction, meaning that we have the auction now for delivery in four years' time, but there will be a one-year ahead auction in 2017. So uh, in order to decide how much to procure now, uh, we should ideally um, estimate how much we're going to get at the last minute, the year before, um, and we should estimate how much capacity is going to be available but not paid. So any capacity with, an with a contract, all the renewables, all the wind and the solar, uh, has to be calculated and estimated and included or deducted from demand to decide how much extra we need. Um, but interconnectors are ignored in the sense that the assumption is that Britain will be an, an, a zero net importer when we need it. <clears throat> uh, so the design of the auction is fine. Uh, the question comes down to how much are we going to procure? Um, and uh, we have a demand curve, best practice. Uh, it's capped at £75 pounds a kilowatt per year. Um, and then depending on the auction clearing price, the volume determined will um, vary. <coughs> so if uh, we need new plants, then National Grid said, well, we think new plant would need 30, uh, £49 pounds a kilowatt per year to make it justifiable to invest, in which case that would be the target volume that they're going to specify. If, on the other hand, we don't need any new plant, uh, then the price is capped for price takers uh, so that they wouldn't get more than £25 a kilowatt per year. And depending on what the price is, we'll either get more or less than the target level. Uh, so National Grid was required to set out what the target level should be and advise the Secretary of State and the panel of technical experts would comment on the quality of the analysis behind this uh, and then the Secretary of State would make the decision on how much to set the target at. <coughs> well, uh, as I said, they had to produce um, an impact assessment uh, of what this capacity auction would produce in benefits and what it would cost. Uh, so the blue lines are the benefits and the red lines are the costs. Now you notice that the benefits all go to the producers and the costs are all paid by the consumers. Um, and the net benefit is the difference between two very large sums. Um, and in particular, in the first few years, the costs are higher than the benefits. This is, if you like, looking ahead to the future. I should also say there have been, I think, five or six impact assessments and each one is very different from the previous one. The difference between two large numbers is a number that jumps around quite a lot. And you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so uh, let's look back at what the supply cost actually is. So as you get scarcer and get scarcer to the left of the diagram, uh, so uh, you run out of ways of balancing the system, more and more expensive ways of balancing the system. And finally, you have to disconnect and maybe at that point you say the cost of disconnection is the value of lost load. <coughs> um, and you can see, depending on who you disconnect, uh, the impact will either be on a small number of large firms or a large number of small consumers. Uh, but there are a large number of actions that can be taken before you get to that. So if you like, that's, that's what we think the theory of the costs of dealing with this problem is. Uh, now, National Grid said, um, well, uh, there are a number of possible scenarios. We don't know what the future holds, so we'll look at different scenarios and we'll work on the uh, least worst regret view um, and what happens as you uh, get less capacity procured, you have a higher risk of a value of lost load and they put that in at £17 a kilowatt and drew these curves. And they said, well, look, 
um, the least worst regrets answer comes out to be the lowest cost, allowing for the cost of not having the power and the cost of procuring power. Uh, and so that was the number they came up with. Uh, that was the least worst regrets, um, and it's, if you like, the most cautious. Uh, and that's what the Secretary of State said we will go for. But uh, this diagram is based on a series of fallacious assumptions, one of which is that all of those actions actually don't cost £17 a kilowatt hour. <coughs> so we think the diagram was incorrectly um, described. But much more critically, we think it leaves out a very important element, and that is interconnectors. Uh, and as Professor Costa said, Europe is now coupled from Finland to Portugal. Uh, so, um, and in particular, Britain was coupled to Northwest Europe uh, last February, um, and the southwest of Europe joined in May. Um, and so now we are supposed to be a single dispatch zone at the day ahead stage. Intraday and balancing will come quite a bit later, I suspect. Uh, we are also planning to build more interconnectors. You can see um, uh, Nemo to Belgium and another link to France are proposed um, sometime in the next few years, and in particular, critically, about the time when we're procuring capacity. Uh, but those aren't even mentioned in the analysis. And if you look further ahead, there are just a large number of proposed interconnectors to Norway. Uh, there's this crazy idea of connecting Iceland, which has been around for 20 years and probably will be around for another 20 years, um, and even a proposal to connect to uh, maybe as far as Spain. I'm not sure about that. But the economics of building interconnectors looks pretty attractive if they can get um, regulatory approval. So. Um, the government admits and has uh, written, uh, uh, commissioned various reports uh, about the impact of interconnectors on security of supply. And the simplest way of measuring that is if you have an interconnector, how much less capacity do you need to build domestically in order to meet your security standard? Uh, and one of the reports commissioned by the Department of Energy and Climate Change said somewhere between 50 and 80 percent. So if you have a gigawatt interconnector, you need 50 to 80 percent of a gigawatt uh, less domestic capacity to meet the security standard. Um, we have good examples. So in 2012, when it was very cold, France was importing nine gigawatts.